Up until now in the book of Luke, in the gospel of Luke, the disciples have been mostly observers of what Jesus is doing, right? They're just kind of hanging out. Uh, and, and what amazing things they've seen over the last three messages from Luke we've seen and the disciples have realized that Jesus has power and authority over nature. Only God has that. They've also seen that Jesus has power and authority over demons. We've also seen that Jesus has power and authority over illness and even death. And so they've seen all of this. It's getting into their heads who he is. He is not just another rabbi, not just another wise man, not just another uh, um, one coming out of Israel calling followers to him. Jesus is something else and something different. And now the game is about to change for them too. A leading American pastor has lamented that why is today's church so weak? Why are we able to claim many conversions and enroll many church members, but we have less and less impact on our culture? Why are Christians indistinguishable from the world? Why aren't we more different? I think there's three reasons. First, we think our salvation, or too often we think our salvation, is only about the future, what we get. We get heaven, everything's good, we're all good. And we're looking at the future, and we, and we, we tend to think of salvation as that, a guarantee of heaven. It certainly is that, don't get me wrong. But I think we're going to find out that it's much more. Secondly, that we have an unbiblical distinction between the words Christian and disciple. To be a Christian is to be a disciple and vice versa. The term Christian came about in the church at Antioch when they were trying to describe who are these people that follow this Christ, this Messiah, this anointed one. Well, let's call them Christians. They would have never been called that if their lives weren't distinctive from those around them. That's how the term came. We often think, well, I'm a Christian. I not, don't know if, how serious a disciple I am. The two words are interchangeable. Thirdly, when we do think about how our faith plays about what we do now and we tend to think the commands of Jesus are impossibly high and that he was way too idealistic and that he could not have possibly meant that we actually do what he calls for. Well, he must have been speaking metaphorically when he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, can he really expect us to do that kind of thing? So we see those things from the Sermon on the Mount and things that we've talked about here on Sunday morning. We think, well, Jesus, you just set the bar too high. I'll, you know, I'll do my best. But I'm not sure I can pull it off. Not paying attention to the, to the fact that after that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, uh, everybody who hears what I say and does it is like a wise man. Everybody who hears what I say and ignores it or doesn't do it is like a foolish man. Jesus apparently expected us to be able to do what he taught, not just know it. And so, uh, I, I, again, I don't know where we get these ideas from because they are not in any way scriptural ideas. So here's the focus question this morning that I want us to think about as we come to Luke chapter 9, and that's that. That's this. How did Jesus disciple his disciples? How did Jesus go about doing this thing that we call discipleship? That's what we're going to talk about. Um, Sioux Falls Seminary, which is, uh, uh, it, it used to be called North American Baptist Seminary. It's in Sioux Falls. It has now expanded out beyond just North American Baptist people. It had to if it was going to survive, frankly. So they've done that. And they have entered into a thing that they call competency-based theological education. Basically what it means is this. For too long, we've trained pastors and Christian workers to know a lot of stuff, but we really haven't trained them to be competent Christian workers. We're sending too many people out that have a lot of knowledge, but no skill. We're sending too many people out that know about the Bible, and yet have zero people. They'll walk by people. <laughs> they won't engage people, even in their own church, and uh, there's a problem with the way we're training men and women for Christian ministry. We're, we're, we're putting knowledge into their heads, but we're not 
really teaching them skills. In, in a landmark book that came out in 1999 by Dallas Willard called The Divine Conspiracy, he routinely uses the word apprentice for discipleship. And I think it's a good word because here's the deal. Heather has this on her door of her office. I love this picture. It's Jesus teaching his disciples, and they're at desks, doing what uh, high school students would do if they're sitting at a desk, throwing spit wads, you know, kind of daydreaming. And, and the idea, Jesus did not make disciples this way. Why do we? Discipleship is not simply a transference of knowledge from one brain to another. Jesus had an absolute method to it. And so I think it is good for us to think of discipleship or as a disciple as an apprentice. As an apprentice. Why? Well, here's a definition of apprentice. A person who is learning a trade, again, not just knowledge. Of course they have to learn knowledge to learn the trade. A person who is learning a trade from a skilled employer having agreed to work for a fixed period of time at low wages. Okay, let's take the low wages out of it just for a second and just focus on that first part. A person who is learning a trade from a skilled employer. If we think of discipleship more like that rather than I just want you to know that Jesus is God in the flesh, that there's a trinity. In other words, just passing on the knowledge of our faith rather than any skills related to what Jesus told us to do. Now, let's, there's a subversive thought to that, and that's this. If it is true that we are not making an impact in our world and culture anymore that we may have used to, we might think that perhaps we're not making that impact, not in spite of what we're doing, but because of the way we're doing it. In other words, we're not truly training people to live like Jesus. We're simply passing knowledge on about him, and if you know the knowledge and pass the test, then, then you're good. And we're not really looking into how lives are lived. Jesus, when, he had a method, and, and, the, and when he called his disciples, the first thing that he said was just to be with him. I don't know about you, but that's a little bit intimidating. You are, Jesus invited the disciples to be with him, to watch him. Now, I think about, am I confident enough to invite people to watch me on a daily basis? That's the first step of discipleship, of apprenticeship. Be with me. Just hang out. Then he let them watch what he did. And the miracles were, of course, part of that. And now the game's going to be changed. Dallas Willard again writes this, and perhaps it's how we think about Jesus that we put him on such a high level uh, in terms of spiritually, that we don't give him credit for intelligence. And so he writes this, Jesus is not just nice, he is not just powerful, he is brilliant. He is the smartest man who ever lived. He is now supervising the entire course of world history, according to Revelation 1.5, while at the same time preparing the rest of the universe for our, our future role in it. He always has the best information on everything and certainly also on the things that matter most to human life. In other words, if he truly is the smartest man who ever lived and is telling us how to live and what to do, wouldn't it make sense that we took all of that a lot more seriously and became apprentices? All right, so that's where we're going today, and I'm going to ignore that quote there. The first point today is this. Jesus gave his apprentices tools for their mission. Remember the question, how did Jesus disciple his disciples? The first thing he did was, as he sent them out was he gave them tools for their mission. The passage in Luke chapter 9 says this, and he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now that last verse basically summarizes it. He sent them out, proclaim, the, say something, you have a message. But also along with that, I'm going to give you power and authority to heal. 
and of course to cast out demons. Jesus understood the principle that if you enlist people for a job, you empower them to do it. He didn't just send them out and say, good luck, be warm and well fed, all right? <clears throat> that was not how he did it. <clears throat> he said, you're going to encounter things, excuse me, <coughs> <clears throat> you're going to encounter, <clears throat> okay, I think I got it. You're going to empower things, you're going to encounter things, and, and I am going to give you, and he uses two words, power, we get the word dynamite, dynamite from it, dunamis, power means yeah, you, have the, you have the power to do it, you have, the, you have the, the wherewithal to do it, you can do it. And then secondly is authority, you have the right to do it. So he gave power and authority to heal and to cast out demons. You're going to have the message here, but you're also going to have power and authority to do those things. So he gave his disciples the tools to do what he called them to do. He sent them to do what, according to this? Proclaim the kingdom of God. That's first. Proclaim the kingdom of God. The preaching that he told them to do is all about the kingdom of God. Of God. Well, what does that mean? That's such a huge term that it's often difficult for us to define what it means. What the kingdom of God means basically is that God's rule is established here and it's come. The reason they could say that is that the king was here. Jesus was here. Therefore, the kingdom was here. When the kingdom is here, things get turned right. Disease gets healed. Demons are sent flying. The miracles that Jesus did and also his apostles did were to display and to support the message that the kingdom was here. And this is what it looks like. Now we know now the king is at the right hand of the father, but he sent his spirit here right now and he gives us the ability to show people what living in the kingdom looks like. That means we are living in the kingdom and not in the kingdom of this world, if we take Jesus seriously. The way the kingdom looks now is that we love one another, that we are unified with each other, that supernaturally we love our enemies, we pray for those who hate us. We are living counterculture lives because Jesus was counterculture. We may not do all the signs and wonders that he does, but frankly, it is a miracle when you see somebody loving enemies these days, is it not? We live differently. Our relevance to this world is our difference from it. Not our judgment of it, our difference from it. That's how we display the kingdom of God is here. They displayed it. Jesus gave them the power and authority to do the things that he was doing. They are preaching the kingdom of God. Look, the, and this is to the Israelites. Your Messiah is, is here. Your king is here. And he welcomes you into the kingdom. It's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like, by the way. It doesn't look like what the scribes and Pharisees are telling you it's supposed to look like. It looks different. That's why it was so difficult so, for so many to accept it. But again, he didn't just send them with a message. He sent them to engage the needs of people as they announce the kingdom. I don't think we have to talk way too long about this. And I have already given you a couple of years ago the, the illustration of a sermon given by E.V. Hill to the North American Baptists in 1984 that we need to both win them and feed them. We have a message the gospel, the good news of Jesus. God is for you. He sent his son to die for you. We have forgiveness of sins. They receive the message or they're open to the message based on how we love them. So we want to win them, but we got, you, can't take it to, you can't split it apart without messing it up. You can't. The Bible doesn't. We see it over and over and over again. That Christian proclamation and Christian service always go hand in hand. They are two sides of the same coin. You can't split it off. Grace and truth. Always. 
Don't try to rip it apart. Because when we do, we lose grace and we lose truth. It's amazing. So, that's how we engage the world. Now, let me say something that's fairly strong, and I try to apply it to myself as well. If we are an apprentice of Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit in our life, this kind of engagement is natural. This is, this is what the Spirit prompts us to do all the time. If you and I are somehow not engaged in the world in this way, it probably means we're somehow quenching the voice of the Spirit of God within us. Or we're letting fears rise where confidence should be that the Spirit gives us. If we've grown cold and indifferent to the needs of humans for the gospel of Jesus and and our biggest need then is to pray that God would simply break our hearts. To love those who God loves. To engage those that God wants us to engage. We truly are the body of Christ, right? What does that mean? It means that while we're here on earth, we are engaged in doing the things that Jesus would do if he were in your house, living in your neighborhood. It doesn't have to be huge. I like what Sam said. If you, can, if you can touch one person, Jesus has people elsewhere. <laughs> he knows the mission field. And he knows what he's called you to do in it. We don't have to be world beaters in this. Jesus is only going to hold us responsible for what he's called us to do in our time and in our place. So the message then is simply do it. Simply do it. And if you're not engaged, ask God to somehow break your heart to it. To do the things Jesus would do if he were living in your house, in your neighborhood. That you would use the gifts and experiences God has given you to tell your story. So, the way Jesus trained his disciples, the first application point is this. Disciple making equals job preparation, and I would, you could substitute the word job for mission preparation. He's given you a mission. Not just to know stuff, but to have a mission. And he's given you the tools to do it. Believe it or not, you have the tools to do exactly what Jesus has called you to do. Simply get out there. Sometimes we learn what tools we need on the fly, right? Whoops. <laughs> but we do learn them, and Jesus gives, it, gives them to us. All right, secondly, how did Jesus train his, how did Jesus disciple his disciples, or how did Jesus apprentice his apprentices? He required trust from them. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey. No staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. How many of you have been watching or have seen The Chosen? This particular scene where Jesus is calling, he's gathered his disciples together, and he's now sending them out two by two. The, 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 the scene from The Chosen is largely taken from Matthew's version of this event. Luke is very close to Matthew in terms of what it looks like. But if you've seen that episode, you can see the absolute terror that the disciples came to as Jesus began to send them out two by two. All right, so Matthew and Simon the Zealot. You go, you go south, all right? And I forget the other pairings, but I certainly remember that one. Because when he put them together, all the disciples began to look uncomfortably. And Jesus said, by the way, Simon, they called him Z. By the way, Z, the other disciples are laughing because they are wondering why I put you with the tax collector. <laughs> all right. Why would I put this zealot who hates Rome with somebody who used to work for Rome? And that was precisely the point, wasn't it? That's a miracle. But Jesus required trust 
from his apprentices. Don't take stuff with you that you don't need. There are four prohibitions here. Don't take a staff. Now when we come to the Gospel of Mark, he says they can take a staff. The solution probably involves either an extra staff uh, staff or procuring one. It's, It's difficult. We don't have time to get into it all. But everything else is basically the same. Don't take a bag. Well, what's the bag? The bag probably refers to the purse that traveling philosophers or other religious figures carried to keep money and to take offerings while they were out. Jesus said, you're not going to do that. Don't take a bag with you. No bread. You're not going to take food with you. Can't we even pack a lunch? Apparently not. No bread. And and by the way, no money. Well, how are we... We need to lodge, Jesus. What are we going to pay him with? Our good looks? And you know we can't do that. No money. And only one tunic. Not two. It's just going to slow you down. Jesus tells them to travel light. Travel light. (laughs) Imagine that. Have you realized the more possessions you have, the more time it takes to upkeep the possessions? I have. That's why I'm a lousy owner. (laughs) It takes time. If you own stuff, it takes time to take care of it. And taking care of it is a responsible thing to do. But the more possessions we have, the more time it takes. He said, travel light. I don't want you to take anything, basically. I want you to be so focused on what I'm telling you to do that I want no distractions. You are going to have to trust me as you go. You're going to have to trust your Father in heaven. We trust Jesus when we listen to him and we act when he whispers to us through his spirit. Hey. Go next door. Hey, go talk to that person who it's uncomfortable to talk to. Hey, you know the voice, don't you? We trust Jesus when we follow him where we don't want to go, but we know for sure he's telling us to go there. We trust Jesus when bad things happen to us, and yet we keep praying and keep believing that he has our best interests at heart when we do descend, when we do not descend into bitterness. A great scene, again, I wish I could show it to you, but I didn't have time, but if you've seen it, you understand. Of the disciples, there's the one, James, he's called James the Less in most places. It's not James, the brother of John, it's James. In, in the show, he's called Little James. Little James has a deformity. He has to walk with a, with a staff and a cane. And here he's seeing Jesus do what? Heal everybody around him. And before Jesus sends him out, and he says, I want you, by the way, to go heal as part of your ministry, James, little James, approaches Jesus with the question that's been on his mind for a long time, why haven't you healed me yet? And it was a brilliant scene. Jesus says, because I trust you, James. How many people do you think I trust with this kind of thing? To see you heal people without being healed yourself, you're going to have some stories. It, it, it brought tears to my... It, it, was, it was so powerful to trust Jesus even when we don't understand, even when we think we've gotten the bad end of the deal. But we don't descend into bitterness. We trust him. We trust Jesus when we don't depend in the church on a lot of technological bells and whistles thinking that our success will be determined by all of that. A lot of times that just distracts us from doing the much more difficult work of engaging people. We're trying to wow them rather than love them. We trust Jesus when we do that. We trust Jesus when we go to people rather than expecting them to come to us. When we are willing to be inconvenienced rather than ask people to be inconvenienced to come here on our time and in our place. Do you understand? So, application of this discipleship equals dependence on Jesus. We know that. It sounds so simple. God is in control, so we don't have to be. Does that sound familiar? He's powerful. 
Okay, third point. Jesus required his apprentices to receive help graciously. He said this, whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. In other words, as you go into a village, you will find somebody who will help you. A um, couple of weeks ago, um, and this, you know, the police helicopter was flying around here as it does <laughs> from time to time. There were noises, fireworks, who knows if it was gun or fire. But anyway, the police helicopter was flying around, and I walked out. It was about 9 o'clock on a Sunday evening, and I walked out. Our neighbor, Sam, was, was out there, so he and I were talking. And then another guy came up, and, and we engaged him in conversation. See, God but even uses police helicopters to get us out there. If I hadn't bothered to go out, I'd have never met this guy. So he, he comes around, and, and we're talking, and he then asks, are you, are you associated with the church? And I said, well, a little bit. <laughs> oh, well, you guys just had an event there a couple, uh, like a week ago, right? I said, yeah, yeah, we did. We had, you know, we had a lot of stuff going on. We just wanted to invite our, our neighbors and in our, our community to our, to our place and have some fun. We had jolly jumps for kids. Next time you, uh, no, the first question, did they charge you for those? Yeah. <laughs> Next time, ask me, I'll let you use them for free. Oh. That is a person of peace that the Bible talked about. That's the kind of person Jesus is talking about here. As we enter the mission field, there's going to be people who are going to be willing to help us. And we would never expect it. So Jesus says, when you find that house or that person, stay there. Stay there. It was made necessary to stay there because of his previous command not to take a lot of stuff, including food. This is the difference, and this is one thing I think in all of our work, in our community work and things like that, this, this is the difference, and we kind of have to get off this a little bit, the difference between doing things for people, which is great, we should do things for people, and simply being with people. In one way, we're kind of like a parent, a nice parent. The other way, we're dependent upon. We, we, we choose for them to serve us because we need it. By the way, have you ever noticed that if you give a command, you get resistance right away, but if you make a request, people are a little more willing to fulfill it? Jesus is so brilliant. He understands human psychology better than all of us put together. He understands people. He knows there are going to be those who will do this, who will, who will give us help. And so he says, find those people. Be content with your humble conditions and be content to accept the fact that you are going to need the graciousness and the generosity of others to do what I'm telling you to do. Trust me and be willing to receive help. So the application here is discipleship equals partnership with others. We can't do this by ourselves. We're going to need others. And frankly, we are going to reach people by allowing them to help us. Because they're going to see what we're involved in. They're going to see what we're all about. They are going to, they're going to say, yes, I want to be part of that. I can, I can do that. He wants us to be the person who is receiving the help on the climb, not the person who's always giving the help. That, this is kind of revolutionary for us. All right. Fourthly, Jesus prepared, and this is, this is important, prepared his apprentices for rejection. Listen to what he says. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. In Matthew, he says, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah at the judgment than for that town. Later on in his ministry, Jesus pronounces woe to certain cities who saw what he did and yet rejected him. 
Wow. Have we ever thought of that? There's no greater disappointment, is there, than to engage, help people, be with people, only to be rejected by them. Frankly, that's one of our fears, and it's one of the reasons we don't engage in the first place. In other words, our greatest fear is happening. We're going to be rejected. They are not going to like us. That's hard on me. I don't like not being liked. My first ministry up in Lodi, California, I came from here, and a family everybody knew and loved, and I go to Lodi, and everybody says, who in the heck is this young kid? For the first time in my life, now it probably went on and I was just totally unaware of it, but for the first time in my life, I experienced open rejection. I'm a nice guy, what's going on here? Why do you hate me? We have such fears. <laughs> such fears. Disappointment. Jesus makes it clear that not everyone will be nice. And it's interesting that he does not hold his disciples accountable for the rejection of the message. He doesn't. He holds those who reject it accountable. He doesn't tell his disciples, go and keep trying. Knock yourselves out until they say yes. Manipulate them. Do 20 verses of just as I am until the whole people come forward. He doesn't tell his disciples to keep trying in the same place. Use better tactics. He says leave. And not just leave. But let them know that as you are leaving, they are responsible for the rejection. Now, they may not care about that, but it just may open them up where just the simple message hasn't. Or later on, they could remember. But, but whatever the case, Jesus does not hold you responsible for somebody else's response. He says, stop knocking yourself out and move to a more receptive place where you will find the person of peace, where you will find the place where they will cooperate with you and help you. Life is too short, in a sense, what he's saying. The Jews who traveled abroad, if they went into Gentile territory, when they left, they would carefully shake the dust of the, of the Gentile lands from their feet and clothing. This act disassociated them from from what they saw as the pollution of those pagan lands, and that judgment was going to come. Well, this is the same action. Jesus is basically saying to these Jewish people, when you're going to go into a place where there are other Jewish people, and if they don't listen to you, I want you to treat them in the same way that you would treat a Gentile place. Yes, they're your countrymen. Yes, they believe in God, but they're rejecting the most important message they will ever hear. And you've given them evidence that the message is true through healing them and through casting out demons. The ultimate evidence that the message is true is the resurrection of Jesus. So here's the application. Discipleship equals resilience. Resilience, courage. It's like this. You're that little leaf. <laughs> You're a little plant growing in a dry crack. Keep at it, but don't keep at it in the same place. Be as wise as serpents, Jesus says, as harmless as doves. Be smart. Okay, finally it's this. The result is curiosity about Jesus, very quickly here. It says, they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, Herod, this is Herod Antipas, this is the son of Herod the Great, who ruled in the Galilee region. Jesus would see him at his trial. This is also the guy who had John the Baptist beheaded. It's that Herod. Now, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, look, I beheaded John, but who is this about who I hear such things? There's that question again. Who is this guy? And he sought to see him. 
Now we know from the trial of Jesus, he was just, he was just wanting to see some tricks, some cool things, some entertainment. But he had, sure was curious about it. And that's kind of our job, to create curiosity about Jesus. Did I say that? Yes, I did. <laughs> All right. We are failing at our task if in our preaching of the gospel and demonstration of it through our lives, if people are not curious about who Jesus is. He's more than just how to make your marriage better or how to raise your kids better. It's, it's way more than that. If it doesn't bring people to a decision point and understanding that I either have to accept this message or reject it. There's no middle ground here. But I'm sure curious about him. In the end, the gospel is Jesus. When we get distracted thinking it is other things and forget that it really is all about this person who is the greatest person who was ever born, who is the smartest guy who ever walked the face of the earth, who is God incarnate, who died for forgiveness of sins and rose again from the dead to validate that message. If we make it about ourselves or about, hey, do you want to have ten steps to a better life, that misses the point. It is about Jesus. It's about who he is and everything he's done. Now, they may get a better life. Certainly, I have a better life because Jesus is in my life, but it's not about that. It's about him. That's just a perk that comes along with it. Heaven is a perk that comes along with knowing Jesus. It is not even the goal. Jesus is the goal because with him comes the whole ball of wax. Discipleship, therefore, is turning the attention of others to Jesus. And if our attention isn't there in the first place, how in the world are we going to do that? I make it a point to separate my baseball life from my pastor life. If I didn't do that, I would be very distracted this morning. 11 to 2 for crying out loud. You see how easy, though, Distraction comes in. It is all about Jesus. So our job is that. That's our job. And we need to be skilled in that job. We need to be more than simply passing on information. We need to, this is the one. Hang out with me for a while. Ooh. Watch what I do. Ooh. Now do the things I'm doing. Ooh. Jesus was not interested as he discipled his disciples to pass along, here's information about the God you, you know. Let me teach you everything in the Old Testament. Of course, knowledge is part of the game, but it's not all of the game. It is the part of the game that allows us to understand who we're following. And to get it right, Jesus did care what people thought of him, as we're going to see later on in this text. He did care that people got it right concerning his identity. Because there's a lot of other false things out there. It is important to get the information right. But that's just where it starts. It does not end there. It ends as we become proficient. It ends as we become skilled at making disciples and teaching them to observe everything Jesus taught us and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Here's our application question. As we close, the band comes up. Do you have any apprentices? in your life. It's okay if it's just one. It's okay if it's your children. In fact, way to go if it's your children. 
or your grandchildren. They count. Sometimes we almost look at them as well. And it's, well no, they count. Who else is going to teach them? Does your training get beyond a classroom? On the flip side, do you have a mentor? Are you learning not just ministry knowledge, but ministry skills? And are you producing curiosity in people around you about Jesus? Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, this is such an important passage, such an important transition in the lives of your followers, your apprentices, as they move from learning from you to doing what they saw you doing. Lord, help us, if we haven't already done it, to make that transition, to become skilled in what you call us to do because we are learning it from you and you've given us the tools. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.